I don't know what stories Imam Hanif was up here telling you guys about this and about that. Alhamdulillah, I was blessed and I was very fortunate to meet uh, Imam Hanif and not just in the later years. I don't know if he remembers, but when I first went to Medina when I was 18 years old in 2002, we met a few times. We would see each other at the lessons. I didn't know uh, Hanif too well. Uh, he was very quiet, very, you know, point A, point B, not, real non nonsense type of guy. But we would speak to each other briefly, and it was basic respect. And then after some time, many, many years went by, many things happened, many things changed and developed. Uh, Allah Azza wa Jal, He decreed and He chose for us to cross paths again. And Alhamdulillah, uh, we had different brothers that we knew, mutual friends, and he introduced himself, I introduced myself, and he said what he was about and what he was looking for and what he wanted to do, and literally that was it, literally, that was it, kalas. It was nothing that was needed after that, and Alhamdulillah, it was nothing more but time and time and time and time and time and time. So with regards to a younger student and an older sheikh and things like this, I don't know what stories he was telling you. I came in, I was a little late. I would counter all of the things that he was saying with the statement of Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, and then secondly, the statement, uh, the statement of a later day scholar, Sheikh Abdul Rahman ibn Nasr al-Sa'di. Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, he was the teacher of Imam al-Tirmidhi, as it's well known. And one of the greatest students of Imam al-Bukhari was Imam al-Tirmidhi. Not necessarily the greatest, but he was from the greatest. Maybe the greatest. Imam al-Bukhari, he was so humble, and he had so much respect for his pupil, Tirmidhi, that he narrated a hadith from him, which is a rarity. And he also said to him, Man bika bi akthar min man minni, o He says, the, you, you, the benefit that you got from me, supposedly, is no more than the benefit that I got, what? From you, in reality. As far as Ibn Sa'idi, rahimahullah, that one day his students came and he asked them a question, and a bunch of questions, as if they were like aggravating questions or problematic questions. So the student, he apologized. And Sa'di, rahimahullah, he says, نَحْنُ مَمْنُونُونَ بِكُلِّ مَا تَأْتُونَنَا بِهِ مِنْ مَشَاكِلٍ He says, every time you bring us a problem or a headache or issue or a question that seems like it's aggravation, he says, we're lucky. You're doing us a favor. You're helping us out by bringing something that you look at as a burden. So in actuality, the teacher supposedly, or the sheikh or the instructor, in our school of thought, Hadith Disciple School of Thought, Disciplism, one of the ways of you learning to be a master is by you continuing being a student. And that you learn everything from the student. So the teacher is actually benefiting from the student if there's even a student-teacher relationship, if that's even there, let alone if we're just brothers for Allah's sake and we're just helping each other out. We open up a book or two or three, we read, you know some things, you tell me, I may know a few things, I may tell you. Everybody understand this? But if there's actually the uh, uh, teacher and student relationship, then a true teacher is one who learns from the learner. He learns from the learner. And he has just as much respect and regard and veneration for the student as the students that have for the teacher. Okay? And anytime you see someone being tyrannical with knowledge and holding themselves up and above someone who's beneath them and below them, then that is a major telltale sign. That's a red flag, a huge red flag. When someone demands, they themselves demand their rights and their respects from someone who's younger or lesser in knowledge or less virtuous, something's wrong. Because a true teacher is supposed to be humble. As Ibn Rajab, Ibrahim Allah Ta'ala mentioned, and Fadlu ilm al-Salafi ala ilm al-Khalaf, 
he quoted Al Ajuri rahimahullah from Akhlaq al Ulama and others who came of the past. He says, Yamagil al Alim and Yada'a at Turaba ala Rasihi Tawadu an Allah. They said that a scholar has to be humble and so humble for Allah that he should manifest this humility by putting dirt on his head. Manifest the humility, all right? So this is the true sign and mark of true knowledge, is humility. And the opposite is the opposite. Sheikh Bakr Abu Zayd, ta'ala, he was asked, how do you know when your knowledge is beneficial? How do you know when you're learning? Which is a very commonly asked question. Brothers, they ask this all the time, and sisters as well. I've been studying Andrew Mia, I've studied Bequniya, I've studied this book, I've studied that book, but I don't feel like I'm soaking it up. I don't feel like I'm retaining it, so on and so forth. He was said that the sign that you're learning and benefiting is that every time you get more knowledge, you become more and more what? More and more humble. Khayran, inshallah. We would sit here all night, literally, talking about this, quoting the importance of knowledge and the beauty of knowledge. And as the people of knowledge of the past, they used to say, Al-ilmu silatun bayna ahlihi. It says that ilm is like a womb. It's like we all have the same mother. Even though we have different mothers, different fathers. He comes from California, I come from Philadelphia, East Coast, West Coast. But Allah Azza wa despite all of those states in between that distance, He brought us together and He made me closer than many brothers that came from my own city. That's, that's what Allah Azza wa decrees. It's deep if you think about it, let alone age, let alone this, let alone that. But Alhamdulillah, knowledge is the thing that brings the people together and it unites the people, huh? Khairan, inshallah. With that being said, because we don't have a lot of time, uh, Imam Hanif, may Allah bless him, speaking on the youth and quoting the different ayats in the Qur'an regarding the importance of youth. And from them is the story of Ashab al-Kaf, one of the most marvelous stories of the Qur'an. One of the most marvelous stories of the Qur'an al was the people of the cave. And Allah Azza wa says, إِنَّهُمْ fitiyatun," That they were young men. And he mentioned the ayah from Surah to Yunus. Yunus, the prophet Jonah. And he mentions that the people of Musa, those who believed in him, how huh, only a what? The Riyah, progeny, offspring. And the older ones were afraid, so on and so forth. This is very interesting. A couple of weeks ago, or maybe about a month ago, I was in uh, Beacon, New York, upstate New York, uh, with the brothers and the sisters up there, and I gave a lecture on the same exact topic, the importance of youth in Islam. And subhanAllah, I quoted the same ayat that he quoted. 100%. I didn't speak to him. He didn't speak to me. I didn't know he was going to quote or he was going to say that. The exact same proofs that he mentioned, that's what I said in my lecture. From the things that show us the importance of the what? Of the youth in Al-Islam. And I also mentioned uh, a sad reality that isn't that pleasant, but it's a reality. At the end of the day, we never have to apologize for reality or for the truth. Is that when we talk about youth in Al-Islam, and protecting our families and keeping them upon Islam. Not all the time, but oftentimes it's too late. Oftentimes it's too late. Um, and unfortunately, many parents, they only look after their children and think about their children and talk about their children and the importance of their children when it's too late. It's too late, just like one's health. I mentioned this. Most people don't go to the doctors regularly. Most people don't watch what they eat, what they drink, how many hours you sleep, one's sex life. Do you exercise? How do you sleep? What type of mattress do you sleep on? The average person doesn't give the necessary amount of attention to his bill of health until it's what? Too late. You get a pain. You get a rash. Something is too big, too small. Something is aching. You go to the doctor and says, Doc, fix me. And oftentimes the doctor says, there's nothing I can do for you. You've been doing this to your body for 20 years. For 10 years, eating this, drinking this, smoking this, not sleeping, not eating, living a celibate lifestyle, whatever the case may be, it's too late. I can't help you. I can numb the pain. I can put something that, you know, take out of suffering, but I can't fix it. I mentioned this sad reality to brothers and sisters in Beacon, New York, and this is the case with our youth. Oftentimes, we don't pay attention to our daughter marrying off our daughters. My daughter needs to get married after she has a boyfriend. She already has a tattoo on her neck. She lost her virginity. She already have followers and people on Facebook or Twitter, social media, boys that she's saying, oh, girls, as we mentioned in the khutbah. And it's too late. You were supposed to think about getting her married when she was 16. She's 20, 19. She's gone. She's lost. Your son, huh? You find a gun in his house, a bag of drugs, and you want to go talk to him, help him out, do this, do that. 
Oftentimes, it's too late. He's already wild. He's already left. You're supposed to have paid more attention, given more respect, more value, and invested more time in the youth before it got to that stage. So I mentioned this to the brothers and sisters in Beacon, New York. The concept of medicine, the quick fix, pills versus herbs. And herbs necessitate a lifestyle. You can't just take the herbs and feel better like that. You have to eat right, you have to sleep right, you have to leave yourself right. Everything has to be in sync for the herb to give you the, the necessary or the expected effects. As far as the pills, pop the pills. You may feel good, it takes away pain, but it comes with a great cost. Your kidney, your liver, this side effect, this habit forming, and then this goes on. And there's no different than the youth in Al-Islam. It's no different than the youth in Al-Islam. It's no different than youth in our Islam. It is a lifestyle as a what? As a whole. And it's not just one lecture or one camp. Your son, your daughter, the young brothers and sisters in the masjid, they have to be bred and cultivated from day one. From day one. Khairan, inshallah ta'ala. Um, with that being said, I don't think it's hidden to anyone the status of the youth in our Islam. And from the things which prove this, is that the Messenger of Allah, والسلام, out of all the companions who learned with him and studied with him, those who narrated the most hadiths from the Prophet وسلم, weren't the Kibar al-Sahaba. wasn't the older companions. Most of them were the younger companions. From among the Khulafa al-Rashidin, the four rightly guided caliphs, the one who narrated the most hadiths from the Prophet وسلم, was Ali ibn Abi Talib, عنه, approximately 400 hadiths. 400 hadiths is a trifle compared to the huh, staggering number of Abu Hurairah, com compared to the staggering number of Ibn Abbas, compared to the staggering number of Ibn Umar, of Aisha, of Jabir, and the list goes on. So this is from the manifestations of how youth are important, and that the Prophet ﷺ, he gave a great deal of attention and time to the youth, and the proof for that is, we don't have to read this hadith and this story, the proof is, is in the pudding. The proof that this father or this mother spent money, spent time, spent effort on his children, is look at what the children are doing right now. Their success. Religious success and worldly success. It shows that the father was there. The uncle was there. The mother was there. That's clear as day. And the opposite is the opposite. So from the things, like we talk about teacher and student, from the things which show the strength of a school and a teacher, is not what the teacher claims and says and the bragging, but it's the what? What do we have, Nafis? What do we have, Sheikh? We have the what? It's shown in the what? The pupils, the pupils manifest the time spent by the sensei. The pupils show the effort and the energy that was put in by the teacher. So the Prophet and Islam, those youth that experienced his blessed company, what did they become? And what did they do? Where did they go? And this goes to show the importance of youth in al Islam. And the Messenger of Allah, والسلام, oftentimes he would address them specifically. Ya ma'ashar al shabab. من استطاع منكم الباعة فليتزوج فإنه أغض للبصر وأحسن للفرج ومن لم يستطع فعليه بالصوم فإنه له وجاه He said, oh, assembly of young men and women. He never called out to the older ones who need to get married. The older men and women who need marriage just as much as the young ones. But he wanted to address the specific youth for a tremendous reason. He said, anyone who can get married should do so. Why should you get married? Marriage comes with problems, you get divorced, you go through a custody battle, this and that, you gotta work, you have time to hang out, have fun, play basketball and soccer and skateboard. Why should you get married in 2018? The Prophet's wisdom was the ultimate wisdom, and it was a real wisdom. He never sugarcoated things. He says, فَإِنَّهُ أَحْصَنُ لِلْفَرْجِ He says, because فَإِنَّهُ أَغَضُ لِلْبَصَرُ وَأَحْصَنُ لِلْفَرْجِ He says, getting married helps you protect your eyes, and helps you protect your sexuality. He says, and those who can't do so, then they should fast. Because fasting is a means of stifling your desires. I.e., what our children look at today and watch is a means of their success or a means of their destruction. You won't find a successful athlete, a successful champion, except that he mentions what he used to see when he was younger. In the living room, his father, his uncle, his aunt, his mother, whether it's a chef, a hockey player, a boxer, a musician, anyone like this. They all tell you about how I was inspired from a young age. And the opposite is the opposite as well, the destruction of the youth. It all starts from what they see. 
and what they look at. And that is why Allah Azza wa Jalla gave us specific instruction in the 24th chapter of Surah An-Nur about when children should and should not enter upon you. When children should and should not enter upon you. Things that they should and should not see at a certain age. Things they should and should not see at a certain age. So the Messenger of Allah, as if he said in this hadith, O oh youth, you have the chance to save yourselves, which many older people don't have the chance and the opportunity to do so. And saving yourself is based off of your eyes, and then is leading it into your private area. Let's see what this hadith uh, equals up to another text of the Quran al Kareem. Allah says, yeah, He says, كل المؤمنين يغض من أبصارهم ويحفظوا فروجهم ذلك أزكى لهم إن الله خبير بما يصنعون. Allah says, tell the believers to lower their gaze. Min أبصارهم, not everything, but some things, and to protect the chastity. ذَلِكَ أَزْكَى لَهُمْ Allah says that's pure for them, meaning for their minds. And looking at everything and doing everything is a means of destroying the mind of the youth. Abdullah ibn Abbas narrates in Hadith of Salih Bukhari that the Prophet ﷺ says, كُتِبَ عَلَى بْنِ آدَمَ حَظَّهُ مِنَ الزِّنَى مُدْرِكُ ذَلِكَ لَا مَحَالَ He says that every human being has a certain portion of zina that he's going to fall into. A certain portion. مُدْرِكُ ذَلِكَ وَلَا مَحَالَ There's no way he can get away to this. He can get out of this. He mentioned the eyes, the feet, the hands, etc. الْعَيْنَانِ تَزْنِيَانِ وَزِنَاهُمَ النَّظَرِ He said the eyes fornicate. And their fornication is looking. And at the end of the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ, he says, وَالْقَلْبُ يَتَمَنَّى وَالْفَرْجُ يُسَدِّقُ ذَلِكَ أَوْ يُكَذِّبُهُ أَوْ كَمَا قَالَ عَلَيْهِ سَلَمْ Listen to the connection of the previous hadith and this hadith. He says, and the heart wishes and wants. And the final stage, the last line of defense, is the private area. And we actualize, does he have the eyes and the hands? Or say, no, we're not going any further than stealing a look or stealing a touch. So the concept of the eyes and the gaze is paramount in Al-Islam. So much so that Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah ta'ala, he mentions many benefits of lowering the gaze. And he says that there is a divine secret, as we mentioned in the khutbah, about the balagha of the Qur'an. He said that Allah Azza wa Jalla says, Allahu nuru samawati wal ard. That Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth. And then he mentions, مَثُلُ نُورِهِ The similarity of his nur, of that nur. That verse came after the command of doing what? Lowering the gaze. So light and darkness is based off of what one sees and what, one's, what one looks at. And it's from the wisdom of the Prophet ﷺ with regards to addressing the youth. To stay clean and to stay pure. Not after it's what? Too late. 16, 17, 18, 19, kalas, the battle is won or lost, it's done. It has to come before that. It has to come before that. So that's something that I mentioned, and I don't think we have to um, reiterate those points for lack of time. I want to read some things to you, B'nai Ta'ala, with regards to today's khutbah. And some more clarification on the hadith that we quoted from Abdullah ibn Abbas, radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, uh, he has in his jami' kitab al-libas, the chapter of clothing, the chapter of clothing. Imam al-Bukhari's book, the proper terminology is not Sahih al-Bukhari, but it's called al-jami' al-musnad al-sahih. We talk about types of hadith books, hadith genres, okay? His genre is called a jami' and a jami' means it's an exhaustive, and comprehensive collection of every aspect of life. Every aspect of life. Not just fiqh issues, not just tafsir, but every aspect of life. From dream interpretation, to the process of his battles, to medicine, to wills, testaments, purification, dental hygiene, anything that pertains to life and death, you're going to find it in a genre of hadith book called a jamia, like Tirmidhi's jamia. So Imam al-Bukhari, he has a chapter in his book, this exhaustive compilation, which is called Kitab al-Libas, the book of clothing. And we live in a time in which people say there's no clothing that a Muslim should or shouldn't wear. There's no such thing as Muslim clothing or Islamic clothing. None of that. It's all cultural. There's no such thing as that. Clothing is not important on Islam. Imam al-Bukhari, he put a whole chapter of it just in his book, the book of clothing. And the subheading, he says here, بَابُ مُتَشَبِّهُونَ بِالنِّسَاءِ وَالْمُتَشَبِّهَاتِ بِالرِّجَالِ He says, men who imitate women, and women who imitate men. 
Men who imitate women and women who imitate men, i.e., in clothing and other than clothing. Men who want to dress up like a woman, or women and women who wish to dress up like a what? Like a man. Now, let's take an example. Let's ask ourselves the question briefly. Uh, is it permissible for a man to wear red in Alice Land? Can I wear red? Can I wear a red shirt? Full blown, 100% red. All red? Yeah, all red. No. Why can't I wear red? It's all over Abdul Salam. Father, one of the two. Why can't I wear red? So, you're, the hadith you're quoting, the Prophet wore a red cloak. Is supporting your view or against your view? Hold on, no, slow down, slow down, slow down. <laughs> your cuff is a little full. Abdul Salam, yeah. you said the Prophet wore a red cloak. Yeah. That would prove that it's haram to wear red for men or, or permissible? It would prove that he wore red, but not this whole gear was haram. Okay. Well, you have another proof, Talut? No, I was going to say it wasn't, it wasn't a solid red. I'll tell you, whether it was solid red or not, the proof that you mentioned is for you or against you. In actuality, it's what? No doubt. That's insufficient proof. Why can't I wear red? Then I'll slam. Is that, Fadl? Bismillah. Why can't I wear all red? Is it because um, the hadith that was quoted about shaitan wore red? Hadith that says that the shaitan wears red. Tayyip. Any other proofs? Anything else? That's it. Well, all right. How about if I ask you for intellectual proof? I don't want an actual hadith. I want you to think why a man can't wear red in Al Islam. Sheikh Hamza. Oh, hey, about that. So I don't like to shake. Well, they come sound. I'm only taking questions about red right now. No, they, they want to uh, what, what's just use the microphone so the sisters here upstairs. Tight, <laughs> <laughs> Bismillah. Tight. Cool. Now nah, you gave your turn on time of the salam. Khalas. <laughs> why can't a man wear red? Fuddle. Because <laughs> it's a woman's color. It's a woman's color. Tabaruj. Tayyip. It's a woman's color. It's a means of tabaruj. That's exactly what I wanted. What's important is, based off of this chapter heading, and this hadith, is much deeper than just the color. A woman, let mention a manly color. Off the top of your head. Quick. Mention a manly color. Gray. Black. Black. Tayyip. Green. Green. Okay. So, is it the color... Or is it the fabric, the style, the tailoring of the piece of clothing? A woman can wear something that's black, and you see this woman, there's no ambiguity that she's a woman. Right or wrong? Possible? And a man can wear red in a certain way or cut or style, and there's no ambiguity that he's a what? That he's a what? Possible or impossible? There's no question about that. So pay close attention now. To someone, he says, we have the, if you learn the Arabic language, he says, tafa'ala. Tafa'ala has a specific meaning. Those who know, is, they study sort of, they know the word tafa'ala. It doesn't, it, has, it doesn't have the meaning of a fa'ala. Tafa'ala means what? Is that a person is doing or done, or he did what? Tashabbaha. Man tashabbaha biqawmin. Is that he what? What does the word mean, the, that scale in Arabic? Tafa'ala. It has a specific meaning. Chemistry. Chemistry, yeah. Tafa'ala means what? Is that a person did an act or a person did what? Deeper than he's doing it. La. Huh. No, 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 no. In other words, the sheer color of red is one thing, the style. The tailoring of it is a what? Different story. A person tafa'ala, tashabbaha. He's trying, mimicking, copying, attempting to what? Look like something or be like something else. Now when I hear to talk about the color red, is it permissible or not? Even though the correct view that it is permissible. And the view that states that men cannot wear red is not a strong view. But when I hear to discuss that in detail. What's important is when we talk about clothing, it's not always about the fabric. Not all the time. Sometimes it is like pure silk. But a silk blends. Is the style of clothing. 
It's not about walking. Men and women both walk, but how you walk, how you hold yourself, imitation, trying to be something that you're originally what? Not. Everybody understand that? Initially, when it comes to clothing. So therefore, uh, he mentions the hadith that we quoted previously and also another narration. Uh, Ibn Hajar, rahimahullah, says in the explanation of, of, of Sahih Bukhari, he says, قَالَ الطَّبْرِ الْمَعْنَى لَا يَجُوزُ لِلْرِجَالِ تَشَبُوا بِالنِّسَاءِ فِي اللِّبَاسِ وَالزِّينَةِ الَّتِي تَخْتَصُوا بِالنِّسَاءِ وَلَلَعْقْسِ al Tabari, the great scholar of tafsir, Imam Tabari, Ibn Hajar is quoting from Tabari, Imam Tabari, he says this means it is unlawful for men to imitate women in clothing and in beautification, adornment, zina. It is impermissible for men to copy the style, not the color, not always the fabric, but the style of a woman in her clothes and in her makeup, her makeup, her beautification, her zina. He says, alati takhtasu bin nisa, from that which is what? Specific to women. That which is specific to women. That which is exclusive to women. He says, wala al-aqs, nor the opposite. Nor the what? No, the opposite. Women are not allowed to wear things, styles, colors, whatever it is that is exclusive to men. And clothing, and men's grooming, and men's adornment, etc. So we automatically benefit, and we already learn, is that unisex in Islam is not necessarily what? Haram. Unisex is not necessarily what? Haram. The concept of unisex is not necessarily what? Haram in Islam. Everybody clear this or not? That which is exclusive to men... And that which is exclusive to women. And the same applies on a this hadith Ibn Umar, man tashabba bi qawmin. That which is specific to the kuffar, and that which isn't specific to the kuffar. Ibn Hajar even says, Qultu, wa katha fin kalami wal mashi. He says, and the same applies to speech, and the same applies to walking. How you walk. A woman is known to walk like this. A man is known to walk like that. He says, well, kalam, how a person speaks and talks. A woman is known to talk like this, and a man is known to what? Talk like that. Let's stop and think about gossip. How many men gossip worse than women? Run their mouths and talk like women. Chat. Talk, talk. Gossip, 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 gossip. It's a well-known characteristic. He says, this is inclusive to all of these different things. He then says, فَأَمَّا هَيْئَةُ libas, فَتَخْتَلِفُ بِاخْتِلَافِ عَادَةِ كُلِّ بَلَدٍ فَرُبَّ قَوْمًا لَا يَفْتَرِقُ زَيُّ نِسَائِهِمْ مِنْ رِجَالِهِمْ فِي اللِّبْسِ لَكِنْ يَمْتَازُ النِّسَاءُ بِالِحْتِجَابِ وَالِسْتِتَارِ He says, as far as clothing, then it goes from country to country. He says, there are certain countries in which women dress very similar to men. Which women dress very similar to what? To men. But a woman's clothing is going to be specific with hijab and with istitar, how they cover and clothe themselves. Like we said about red you may wear a red hoodie, college basketball, college football hoodie, Ohio Buckeyes, Ohio State. And it's a man's hoodie. And a woman wear a red, she wears a red dress that is tailored and molded and modeled to her body. But the color is what? It's one. As an example. As a what? Just as an example. He then says, وَأَمَّا ذَمُّ التَّشَبُّهِ بِالْكِلَامِ وَالْمَشِي فَمُخْتَصٌ بِمَنْ تَعَمَّدَ ذَلِكَ وَأَمَّا مَنْ كَانَ ذَلِكَ مِنْ أَصْلِ خِلْقَتِهِ فَإِنَّمَا يُؤْمَرُ بِتَكَلُّفِ تَرْكِهِ وَالْإِدْمَانِ عَلَى ذَلِكَ بِالْتَدْرِيجِ فَإِنْ لَمْ يَفْعَلْ وَتَمَادَ دَخْلَهُ الدَّمْ انتبهوا هذا مهم جدا هذا منشأ خوط بين كثير ممن يدعي العلم والفقه في هذا العصر ابن حجر هنا says as far as speech a man talking like a woman a woman talking like a man and walking then this is specific to those who do this intentionally. Those who do this what? Intentionally. As far as someone who's made to talk in a certain way, or to walk in a certain way, he says, then that's not necessarily blameworthy. That's not necessarily what? Blameworthy. He says, however, this person is commanded to work against it. To work what? Against it. And if he doesn't work against it, now he's blameworthy. This one point right here, this scholar died hundreds of years ago, will resolve you from many problems of the concept of homosexuality and lesbianism today. I was created like what? This. I was never raped. I was never molested. 
None of these things happened to me when I was younger. I always liked the same sex. I always liked girls. I always liked boys. The person who doesn't have the piercing knowledge, the first thing he's going to say is what? He's going to say, you're lying. That's not true. And he's already stuck now. The person will say, no, I know my life. Trust me. Nothing ever happened to me. I was never exposed to any type of molestation, any type of sexual perversion. That's how I was from day one. No, you're lying. That's not true. And for, for argument's sake, that person may be what? Right. Maybe right. Maybe. Mumkin. But it doesn't just stop there. I've I always been a liar since day one. I've been a thief. It's in my blood to be a thief. My father was a thief. I've always been a bully. Does that mean you can now persist upon that? No. It is your job to do what now? Work against it. And if you fall short and you can't do it, then that's what? Different story. And if you just leave it alone and don't try and don't fight that negativity, now you're now what? Blamed. Everybody understand this? Everybody clear on this or not? This is very important in 2018. A person may, like we said in the khutbah, he may not be the most masculine man. You go overseas, certain countries, how men walk. It's well known. But he's supposed to do what? Everybody clear on this or not? He then says, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, وَلَا سِيَمَا إِنْ بَدَى مِنْهُمَا يَدُلُّ عَلَى الرِّضَى بِهِ He says, especially if it's clear that he's pleased with it. He's okay with talking like a woman or walking like a woman. It's all right. I'm okay with it. In other words, I'm born with a birthmark, a deformity. Most people, they're what about these deformities? They're extremely what? Shy or insecure. I'm not pleased with how I was. I don't want you to see it. Everybody understand this? A person who has too much of this, too little of that. A skinny person wears a lot of clothes. A big person trying to wear less. What, what heck is that? So the concept of a person trying and attempting, and also if a person is clear that he's what? Pleased with what? With being masculine or with a person being what? Feminine. Very important details now. He then says, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, وَأَخْذُ هَذَا وَاضِحٌ مِنْ لَفْذَ الْمُتَشَبِّهِينَ يعني من حيث اللغة تشبه ولم يقول من شبه من شابه ونما على وزن إيش تفعل He says here and this is clearly extracted from the word المتشبهين Not those who look like women but those who what? Look like women Meaning they go towards it They do what? Or, or what? They don't fight against, fight against it. Everybody understand this? Or they don't try to what? Fight against it. And this is any negative quality or element. A person may just be naturally a person that likes violence. Just He's a violent person by nature. You have to do what? You have to work against that. You have to do what? You have to work against that. A person may be cowardly. A man may be a coward by nature. It's not his, it's not his fault that his father never taught him how to be brave and courageous. It's in his blood. But it's his job to do what? Fight against it. And to be ashamed of him referring back to his what? Cowardly nature. Am I clear on this? Ibn Hajar even says, وَأَمَّا إِطْلَاقُ مَنْ أَطْلَقَ كَالنَّوِي وَأَنَّ الْمُخَنِّثِ الْخُلُقِ أو الْخَلْقِ لَا يَتَّجِهُ عَلَيْهِ اللَّوْمِ فَمَحْمُولٌ عَلَى مَا إِذَا لَمْ يَقْدِرْ عَلَى تَرْكِ التَّثَنِّي وَالتَّكَسُّرْ فِي الْمَشِي وَالْكَلَامِ بعد تعاطيه المعالجة لترك ذلك وإلا متى كان ترك ذلك ترك ذلك ممكنا ولو بالتدريج فتركه بغير عذر لحقه اللوم. He then says that a person trying to change him or herself and not to be like the opposite uh, the, the opposite sex is something that has to be done progressively. تدريج it has to be done what progressively. It doesn't happen overnight. You working on yourself and changing yourself doesn't necessarily happen over what? Happen overnight. It takes progressive steps. You have to work on yourself. Everybody understand this? It doesn't happen immediately and instantly. Moving forward, moving forward. He then says, Rahimullah uh, Ta'ala, moving forward. وَاسْتَدَلَ لِذَلِكَ الطَّبْرِ بِكَوْنِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ لَمْ يَمْنَعَ الْمُخَنِّثْ مِنَ الدُّخُولَ عَلَى النِّسَاءَ حَتَّى سَمِعَ مِنْهُ التَّدْقِيقِ فِي وَصْفِ الْمَرْأَةِ كَمَا فِي ثَالِثِ أَحَدِيثِ الْبَابِ الَّذِي يَلِيهِ فمنعه هنا إذن فدل على أن لا ذم على من كان من أصل الخلقة وقال ابن ابن تين المراد باللعن في هذا الحديث من تشبه من الرجال بالنساء في الزي ومن تشبه من النساء بالرجال كذلك 
فاما من انتهى في التشبه بنساء من الرجال لن يؤت في طيب الى اخره طيب then he speaks on many many very interesting issues with regards to 2018 concerning a person performing certain homosexual acts or lesbian acts and things like this the point is brothers and sisters uh, the details of this yeah I need, we need some time to get into them and to really tackle them properly but the point I'm trying to get across is one thing and one thing only and that is Islam is not the only thing that's on a- attack in 2018 religion is being attacked or has been attacked certain traditions values and customs have been attacked for many years and perhaps the last level and stage of purity and authenticity is Islam. And you look at the, the, the world's religion, the major religions in the world, most of them have went, undergo major changes, major changes, secular and nominal changes. But the purity of Islam, even though there are Muslims who are, always don't do the right thing or don't say the right thing and confuse culture with Islam when it's not supposed to be mixed, but it's still no comparison to the other religions. And from the reasons behind that is the Arabic language. There's no classical Arabic, old and new Arabic. I read once in a book regarding the Orientalists and the colonizers of the Muslim lands, they said that the colonizers from Europe were the ones who spread Adadija. They spread the colloquial language, the slang. They promoted it, they funded it, and they pushed the Muslims in Morocco in Tunisia, in Egypt, in Syria, in Iraq, to speak the slang. Because the further they could get them from the pure Arabic language, the easier it was for them not to understand their religion. The easier it was for them to be tricked and deceived on what's meant by this verse and what's meant by that verse. And this, this few minutes that we've read, you see the importance of the Arabic language. And the weaker your mind and your tongue is, the more difficult it is for you to have a proper understanding of what's meant by the Quran and by the what? By the Sunnah. And we don't go too deep, huh? Shaq, just leave it at that, inshallah ta'ala. What's important is, brothers and sisters, protecting our family, protecting our children, we have to protect ourselves first and foremost. Naam Shaq, we have to protect ourselves. And from the ways of protecting ourselves is knowing what Allah wants from us and the roles that Allah Azza has placed upon us. The roles that Allah Azza has placed upon us. All right? Our society, our culture, yeah, I mean, as we said, masculinity, femininity, these things, they're under attack, and they've been under attack for a very long time. And the foundation of a family is this. A man being a man, and a woman being a what? Being a woman. When the man has to play both roles, the woman has to play both roles, or the roles are confused and unknown, then the children, they come out broken. They come out without the proper guidance, without the proper knowledge. And then the cycle continues, and continues, and continues, and continues, and continues, and we have what we have today. So with that being said, brothers and sisters, uh, I believe what we mentioned is more than sufficient, inshallah ta'ala, regarding uh, the importance of our Islam for our children, and to keep our children in the mindset of not allowing Islam or death to come to them, except that they're in a state of submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that can't be done unless you're trying your best to practice Islam all of the time. As we said, 25-8. Inshallah ta'ala. So with that being said, we pray for the Muslim youth, for thabat, and for rushd. Uh, and we pray for the parents to be firm and to be firmly guided themselves. Bidhanai ta'ala, if anyone wishes to add anything, or comment, or any questions on the topic, or off the topic from the brothers and sisters, now there's the time, I believe, before the event. Jazakumullah khayran. Wa sallallahu sallam wa baraka ala abdihi wa rasulihi nabiyina Muhammad. وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا جزاكم الله خيرا